Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast, where we take play, ugh, where we take a look at everything from what's up into the nighttime sky, to equipment, to helpful tips and tricks for imaging and observing. And of course, the last Friday of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. If you've never joined us before, we do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, keep that in mind, because as we move into November, we're going to see that time change. So everything's going to jump up an hour. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, that's starting next month. So, uh, But we do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific. These episodes are generally live when they air. And if you ever miss it or you want to go back and check it out, they are recorded. So you can always go back to anything in our previous uh, episodes and watch whatever episode you want so uh but we thank you for hanging out with us whether you're joining us live right now on friday morning or if you're watching this in the future thanks for hanging out with us uh, this week on the what's up webcast we're talking about eyepieces and let me bring myself up there there we go we're talking eyepieces and when to use them now we've talked about uh eyepieces before um Oh, by the way, before I jump ahead real quick, if you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, go ahead and hit subscribe if you haven't done so. Maybe leave a like on the videos. It does help us keep this going. So if you like what you see here and you want to be kept up with it and you want us to keep doing it, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Um, helps with those analytics. So that's what we need. Uh, so I'm jumping ahead real quick because I want to get to one particular slide here real quick. Uh, if you're new to astronomy or maybe you don't understand some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about today, we did do a complete overview on eyepiece basics uh, a while ago early on in the What's Up webcast. You can go back into the library and watch that episode. We go over eyepiece designs and all kinds of terminology in there that we're going to be using in today's episode. So if you haven't seen that or maybe you're not fully aware of some of the specifications and details we're talking about today go ahead and check that out um, on that episode or you know there's plenty of information online as well so anyway uh, we did something like this for filters we were talking about filter types and how they work and all that fun stuff but um, we started getting questions on when should I use a particular filter? And we get that same question with eyepieces, which comes up a lot. You know, what about this eyepiece? When should I use this eyepiece? What eyepiece should I get? Uh, so that's what we're going to dive into today. So if you need to go back and understand what the basics of eyepieces are, go ahead and check that previous episode. And we're going to get started. Uh, if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer those, or I'll probably get to them at the end. Um, but let's get going. So as I said earlier, let's start with just the overview of eyepieces really quick. And then we'll jump into some of the uses um, for them. So as an astronomer, many of us have started by doing visual. Eventually, maybe you'll get into astrophotography, but visual is generally where we all start. And right now, if you were to get a telescope and start adding accessories, eyepieces generally is the first thing that you're going to start with uh, for expanding your um, equipment. And there's a ton of eyepieces on the market nowadays from many, many very reputable manufacturers as well. So it gets kind of confusing, especially if you're just getting started. Maybe you've got got someone uh, a telescope for the upcoming holiday season by the way if you haven't done that now well, you should really think about getting that taken care of um, but there's it can be confusing so or maybe this is your first year maybe you got a, a telescope over the, the sometime this year a lot of people got into it during the pandemic uh, so maybe you're looking to expand a lot of your equipment and that's what we're talking about with eyepieces there. Um, and there's a lot of different designs of eyepieces on the market. Of course, a lot of these telescopes, including our own, when you get them, you're probably going to get some real basic eyepieces that get the job done. But maybe you want to advance your equipment list a little bit more. Uh, but you can actually 
build your eyepiece kit to reflect on the type of observing that you do. And some designs are better uh, than others for certain types of observing. And that's kind of what we want to do. Now, I will say this, because this is how I learned um, early on, is there's there are a wide range of eyepieces and a lot of different price brackets uh, for eyepieces right now. And if you're looking at something right now and you know down the road you are going to want something higher end, and maybe you know that's what you really want deep down, and maybe if you saved a little longer you could get it, as opposed to buying something less expensive that's going to hold you off until you can get the higher end eyepiece. I will tell you right now from experience, and this is what I've told many other people, is eyepieces tend to stay with you as you switch through telescopes. So it's probably, I would actually recommend that building a good eyepiece set just from the get-go is a good investment for you. Because you can buy lenses that might not meet your needs, but will get you by. And maybe they're more budget friendly for you at the time. Uh, but you don't have to buy everything at once. You can add one here, add one there. And I'm not saying you have to dump a ton of money and go for the top tier stuff either. But buy something quality that you know is going to last you uh further down the observing road don't just buy the cheapest thing because it's going to fit what you need right now because those eyepieces are a good investment as your observing advances and as you switch through telescopes those eyepieces will stick with you so building a nice eyepiece set to have is a good thing to start with but you're going to blow a lot more money buying a bunch of in the middle of the road stuff that you know probably isn't going to do what you want and just save that money and just save up and wait a bit longer and then invest it into the lens that you know you really want. And that might take a while. And maybe that set you're looking for, maybe it's a ton of ethos eyepieces. I don't know. Um, or maybe it's a big set of Explore Scientific eyepieces or whatever it may be. You don't have to get them all at once. Slowly add them to your set. But, you know... Make sure you're getting something good because it's, it's going to last you. Rant over. So some things to consider. Whoops. Hit the button. Number one is what telescope are you going to use? Now, most eyepieces nowadays are very universal. And you can use them on a wide variety of things. Uh, as far as barrel sizes go, um, you can pretty much... There are basically two types of barrel sizes there's inch and a quarter and there's two inch those are fairly universal uh, throughout all the different eyepiece uh, manufacturers at this point so as long as your telescope can handle that you're you're all set so pay attention to the focuser that you're going to use um, but what telescope are you using is a big thing to consider you know um Faster optics are going to be more difficult on certain eyepieces, especially if you're using like a Newtonian or a Dobsonian that's like F5 or faster. There are some eyepieces that, quite honestly, just get shredded um, as you step out towards the edge of the field of view because those faster optics uh, really play hard on some of the eyepieces, especially maybe uh, less expensive eyepieces that don't quite have the edge correction that some of the bigger, more advanced eyepieces do. Um, so that's something to consider. Now, if you have a slower scope, maybe you're using like a Mac or a Schmidt Cassegrain, or maybe you have a, a Dobsonian that's like F6 or slower, they're more forgiving. But faster optics, which a lot of people like doing right now, especially if you're a Dobsonian owner, um, they tend to demand a little bit higher quality optical uh, system when it comes to an eyepiece. Um, another thing, if you're using a coma corrector, a lot of things when you're talking about eyepieces, especially on faster optics, are really, really going to come into play on the Dobsonian owner because a lot of those telescopes are F5 or faster. 
that's kind of just the default and especially in this modern era of dobsonians where now f4 is kind of the the starting point um now you've got some more to consider and a coma corrector is going to help with some of that too but um, those faster optics maybe are in the more affordable dobsonian range maybe you've got one of our i don't know 10 inch 12 inch dobs those are f 4.7 and f 4.9 that's still fairly fast so it can be a little bit more demanding on the eyepiece uh, a big big one is do you wear glasses um if you wear glasses, especially if you're observing uh, with the glasses on, you're probably going to need something that's got better eye relief on it. Um, and it's the same thing if you're going to be doing outreach. I do a ton of outreach. Um, well, now that we're getting out of the COVID era, things are starting to open up a little bit more. But having an eyepiece that has good eye relief can make that better for glasses, uh, glass wearers or outreach. It's just a bigger lens for you to look through. Um, and again, this is one of those things where if you're not familiar with what that is, going back to our eyepiece basics video would be helpful. But basically what eye relief is, is the distance the eye can be in order to achieve the full viewing angle of the eyepiece. Uh, eyepieces that have longer eye relief are better for those who wear glasses because that distance is further. Um, and the eye relief can't generally, uh, does reduce as the focal length of the eyepiece gets shorter so long or i'm sorry uh higher magnification eyepieces generally have lower eye relief on them uh if you are someone who does wear glasses or you're looking for longer eye relief eyepieces uh, a lot of companies do promote those particular type of specifications uh, you're going to want something that's probably 15 millimeters to 20 millimeters of eye relief. There's not a lot on, out there that's 20 millim longer than 20 millimeter of eye relief. Um, some of the ones that come to mind with nice eye relief on them, and this is just off the top of my head. I'm probably going to leave some of them out. Uh, the Celestron XL LX eye pieces are fantastic for the money. Um the Teleview Delight and Delos eyepieces. Uh, the Delos eyepieces are one of my favorite sets. I know Explore Scientific's got some out, um, but there's a ton of them out there. So, but if you are wearing glasses and you need something with longer eye relief, look at the specifications, maybe talk to the manufacturer. You're looking for something about 15 millimeters or longer uh, for that. So take a look at it. I'm, there's plenty of options out there on the market. Uh, lastly, you're probably going to, well, not lastly, I've got a little bit more on it. It's the type of viewing that you're going to be doing. Are you doing the planets, the sun, deep sky? Uh, a lot of modern day eyepieces, uh, that are coming out are very, very flexible and universal for different types of observing. But I have found particularly if you like doing planets and the sun, and maybe some, if you're trying to squeeze out every ounce of light from your telescope um, there are certain eyepiece designs that might be more beneficial for that particular type of use so there's dozens of eyepieces uh, as far as design goes you can look them up there are tons of different designs out there um, we're just going to talk about the basic ones real quick uh, kellner uh, that's a three element design. The apparent field of view on these is fairly small in comparison to today's eyepieces. It's about 40 degree apparent field of view. So you don't really get that space walk effect. Um, these are included in a lot of mass produced stuff, including us at Skywatcher. A lot of our basic, uh, telescopes include them like the heritage. Um, we use, uh, our super eyepieces. Um, these are a reverse Kellner design. So the doublet is on bottom with the singlet on top. Um, so, but there's a lot of companies that will provide a, um, a very basic eyepiece and a Kellner design because of how simplistic it is. There's only three elements in there. Um, you know, we, we use it. Um, it's a nice, they're nice little eyepieces. They're very basic. Um, there's not a lot of high end Kellners at this point. So they're, I wouldn't say they're horrible eyepieces. They're they're not bad. 
Uh, obviously, there's always going to be something better out there, especially when an eyepiece costs, you know, 30 bucks or something like that. It's a very uh, cheap eyepiece uh, to produce. Um, but they're generally decent quality. So they, they definitely do the job. They're going to give you the magnification that you need. Um, and they're going to let you get started observing and probably give you a lot of nice nights out um, with your telescope. But obviously there are more advanced designs, you know, wider apparent fields of view and stuff like that. And obviously as a manufacturer, you can't, you could, you could include a very wide angle you know, 82 degree apparent field of view eyepiece, but those are very expensive and complicated uh, to produce and it would raise the price of a bunch of stuff. So that's why they're generally sold separately. Um, but a Kellner design is a, is a nice eyepiece design to get started. They're fairly sharp. They're gonna give you some nice use, uh, images in your telescope and they get the ball rolling. So nothing wrong with a Kellner. Uh, another one that's pretty popular, you don't see them too often anymore, are the orthoscopics. Um, Botter has made, I think they still do, Botter and Takahashi right now are probably the only two that are still making really high quality orthoscopic eyepieces. Um, it's a four element design. It's very sharp on axis. They're not super great at the edge, but that's not what they're about. Um, a lot of orthoscopic eyepieces are very simplistic design. Um, like I said, they're sharp on axis. And um, there's a lot of very reputable ones that have come out in the past. This is a Zeiss Gina Aus 6mm uh, ortho. Very sharp eyepiece. Um, Zeiss uh, is probably one of the top optical manufacturers in the world. Uh, they made several sets of orthoscopics in the past. Many of them are highly sought after eyepieces um, and still for as tiny as they are, they're very expensive um, for what they are. So more of a collector thing, but the nice thing about it is they're very, very sharp um, on axis. So, if, you know, if you're doing something small and I'm going to, we're kind of going to go over this in a minute, so I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the orthoscopics are very popular. Uh, Botter makes a set right now. Takahashi makes a set right now. And then a lot of the other stuff, you don't find them anymore. So you, Celestron has a very nice set of uh, the old style volcano tops. Um, but you don't find a lot of modern day orthos anymore. It's just the demand has shifted to more exotic eyepieces. Monocentrics. Um, these are, you don't find them too often. There are a couple of... Um, not mass produced companies, but there are a couple kind of uh, second tier companies. And I don't mean second tier as quality. I mean, you don't hear about them too much. Um, but the monocentric eyepiece has really been a staple for extremely sharp on axis images, uh, very high contrast, um, very simplistic design, three elements. And I believe they're cemented uh, together. There's no air gap um, in between there. Um, I had one of the better known ones, the TMB Super Monocentrics. Uh, these are very similar to the high-end Zeiss eyepieces. This thing is crazy sharp, but you can see just how tiny that eye lens is. The eye relief on this is non-existent. You are up on that thing um, to take a look at it. Um, but it was exceptionally sharp on planets uh, because of that simplistic design. <laughs> now, plossels. Plossels are probably the most abundant design on the market nowadays um, just because that the basic plossel design um, is, is a good quality. It gives you a wider apparent field of view. It has better edge correction than some of the other eyepieces that were available. It's kind of a cost-effective, but yet... Uh, it's a cost-effective design, but it provides a nice field. And plossels come in a very wide range, probably about 50-ish millimeters. You know, I've seen the 56, 55 millimeters. There's the 40s, like what Celestron's made. And, um, but plossel, everyone owns a plossel at some point. Um, some of the higher-end... Uh, more quality telescopes will ship with plossels. 
it's just a better design um, and just provides a sharper field uh, in comparison to the other basic designs there. But they're all over the place. Um, fairly affordable eyepiece, um, but still gives you good quality. So with that being said, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. Um, so a lot of the eyepieces we've just talked about are very minimalistic eyepieces. They're not crazy wide apparent fields. They don't have long eye reliefs. Um, very minimal optical designs for elements at the max. Um, a lot of these are nice because they have, if you get a higher quality version of them, of that particular design, they're generally very high in contrast and they have low light scatter because every time you put a piece of glass in the system there, it's one more element that the light has to go through. A lot of these eyepieces are very sharp on axis. We talked about the monocentric design. We talked about the orthos. So those are great for uh, smaller targets that are going to be at the center of the field of view. If you are into planets or observing the sun, that's something to think about. Uh, many of these, they don't have great edge correction. So you're talking about mostly for slower optics or you're going to be doing more high power viewing um and of course eye relief on these is there is no eye relief practically on these you're you're looking at it so uses this is what i was trying to get to this slide uh, if you are into planetary and lunar and maybe you're really hardcore into binary stars uh like real into it. You're trying to squeeze every ounce of performance from that telescope. Something like a really nice ortho or a really nice, um, let me just make this bigger here real quick. A real nice ortho or a monocentric eyepiece. If you're looking for the top tier stuff, that's really what's going to give it to you. Um, and you're probably going to be, you're not going to notice a lot of difference, but when the seeing is there, you're probably going to get something out of it. But this is really, if you're looking to maximize it now, I don't really use monocentrics and orthos anymore. I don't do that type of observing, so it, it doesn't benefit me too much, but I'm really into solar. Um, love looking at the sun, particularly with hydrogen alpha filters and something like that a nice plossal is really all you need because inside of a solar telescope like a hydrogen alpha telescope something like a lunt or using a day star there's a lot of light that's passing through them and there's a lot of reflections that are going inside of there that they work really hard to reduce and i find if you're looking for the best performance on like a hydrogen alpha solar telescope a basic plossal goes a long way you don't need something big and exotic when you're doing solar. Uh, it actually would be better if you go something basic. That's why I have this 40 Plossel. It's, I think they're like $50 new. They're really nothing special, but they do a heck of a job uh, for H alpha viewing because of how simple they are. Um, you know, of course, I've done it with my 31 Nagler before and 41 panoptic they do a nice job but i find the view particularly when you're doing hydrogen alpha a uh, basic plossal goes a long way that simplistic eyepiece design does a very nice job so you don't always need something big and exotic inside of that system you just need something that's going to get the job done so a nice plossal will go a long way for that but if you are really into planetary, lunar, binary stars, or maybe you're doing deep sky, um, there's a very well-known deep sky observer by the name of Alvin Huey. Uh, he lives in Northern California. He's really into observing like ultra faint galaxy clusters. He likes to use a lot of these monocentric and ortho eyepieces because of their simplistic design and squeezing that light out of the telescope. Uh, particularly with large aperture. I think he's using like a 22 or 30 inch job. Um, so so it's, it's just a way of getting every ounce out of the telescope when the seeing allows. 
Now, that's kind of it for the basic stuff. Let's jump into zooms. Now, zooms are kind of a mixed bag, honestly. Um, you know, they're they're a compromise. There are multiple elements in these things, and the elements tend to move. Uh, you're looking at 40 to 50 degree uh, or more. Depends on the model. There's a lot of different ones on the market, and the quality for a zoom eyepiece is all over the map. Um, the cheaper ones are not that great. The higher end ones are actually very nice. Something like the Botter zooms are are pretty good. Now, I find zooms are they're a compromise, honestly, is what they are. So rather than having a whole set of eyepieces you're just going to have that one. So it's very convenient. It's probably good for outreach and general viewing. It's very nice for solar because there's a lot of light involved. But I've never found them to be all that great if you're really trying to do some advanced observing. Like maybe you're trying really hard to see some faint thing or you're trying to get the best performance on the planets. I don't find zooms are that great. Um, but that's the compromise. You're compromising quality for convenience. And that gap, I'll say it right now, that gap is, that is you know, shrinking. You know, Botter, Hyperion zooms, I don't know what generation they're on at this point, but those are getting better. Um, Pentax has some very nice eyepiece, uh, zoom eyepieces. Um, but they, a lot of times, they're generally a compromise uh, for convenience. And as long as you know that going into it, it's it, you'll probably a lot of people enjoy them and they work perfectly fine. Um, a zoom is does the job. However, um, not all zooms I will say are as big of a compromise. There are some specialty uh, zooms that have come out, and the ones I'm talking about particularly are like the Teleview three to six and the two to four. And I think they discontinued the two to four zoom. Um, but there are some specialized zoom eyepieces that might not have as wide a uh, range as some of the other ones out there. And the quality is a bit better on them, but you do pay for them. Uh, so the Teleview zooms are a little bit more of a specialty. Uh, the thing I like about the Teleview zooms is a lot of times, you know, when you're doing high power viewing, I'm not a big fan of Barlow's. I feel like they do hinder the view a little bit. I would much rather just have the eyepiece that gives you the focal length. But a lot of times when you're talking about like some of these specialty zooms, like two to four millimeter and three to six millimeters, that is high power observing right there. And a lot of times you're probably not going to have the seeing conditions to back you up. So maybe it's not worth investing in having a five millimeter and a four millimeter and a three millimeter in your in your box. Maybe it is. It depends on the type of viewing that you like doing. I do know plenty of people who have an eyepiece for everything. Um, but uh, the three to six zoom um, is very nice because when the seeing does allow, you can actually pop that in there, maybe six millimeters, and then you can kind of ratchet it up to give you the particular focal length that you want. So. They're nice to have. It's very convenient. I use this one actually for optical testing. It's a good star test eyepiece because it's easier to get the um, get everything in the six millimeter field, and then we can ratchet it up to three millimeter and do a star test with it. So that's why we have one of these. Um, works really well. Uh, someone in the comments did mention that zooms have a fairly uh, small field, and that is true. So that's kind of another compromise there. A zoom is always going to be, for the most part, a compromise um, because you're getting convenience. Um, but because you have moving optics and all this extra stuff, that can, you know, always change things. Now, let's get to the bread and butter of everything nowadays wide angle eyepieces are pretty much where it's at across the board that's what the market wants right now that's why you don't see a lot of the ortho and monocentrics and any of that anymore because the quality of these wide angle eyepieces has gotten exceptionally good to where 
you know, coatings and polishing technology and stuff like that is allowing us to get major transmission and contrast and all kinds of stuff on these, you know, spacewalk like eyepieces, but you're still able to get, you know, pull all that out of your telescope. Now, when I mean wide angle, I'm generally referring to like 68 to 68 degrees or bigger on the apparent field of view. Um, the biggest one I know is the Explore Scientific 9mm 120 degree eyepiece. Um, it's almost like you're looking backwards behind you at that point. I've had one. The thing is a freaking grenade. It's huge. Um, so make sure you've got a telescope that can handle it. Um, but a lot of modern day wide angle stuff is 68 to 120 degree plus. Um, and there's a great range of these across the market nowadays. Pretty much everyone makes some variant of wide angle eyepiece. And what I mean by wide angle is it's giving you that spacewalk effect. So when you look through it, it's almost like the telescope disappears. You can like move your eye around. It's like looking out of a portal, a uh, porthole in a spaceship or something like that. And the nice thing about wide angle is it doesn't just mean it's low power anymore. It's not like a 41, you know, pan optic where, yeah, it's wide angle because it's low power. It's not like that anymore. Um, you know, you can get wide angle eyepieces at three millimeter focal lengths that give you that wide field of view, uh, apparent field of view. So it's his quality has gotten very, very good from multiple manufacturers um, over the years. Now, here's an example of that. Um, here's a 20 millimeter Plossel and a 21 millimeter Ethos. Now, I know they're not exactly the same focal length, but they're one millimeter difference. It's not that it's not big enough to make a major difference in what we're viewing. But here's the Andromeda Galaxy. I put this on, I think it's a 1500 millimeter telescope, just for example, uh, focal length. And pretty much the same magnification. You're looking at a small section of Andromeda, or you're looking at almost the whole thing with that 100, to 100 degree apparent field of view. Um, so same magnification, much wider field. So that's what I mean by wide angle um, eyepieces. So you can still get that high magnification, but you're going to get that extra field. So it's kind of nice to have it. I know people are talking about it. Yes, these eyepieces are more expensive. You're talking about, you know, lots of glass inside of these things. It takes time to design them, engineer them, and polish all of that uh, together. So they are going to be more expensive, but that's going to give you the quality that you're looking for at that point. I'm not saying you have to go to the top tier, but even the more basic eyepieces, you're probably looking at a hundred and something dollars per lens. So that's kind of where it's at. Now, these are very popular for deep sky observing because uh, you are getting that spacewalk, that wide field look. Um, provides a very wide apparent field of view. Um uh, so you can kind of just cruise around the nighttime sky. Um, higher end options are probably going to be better for faster optics. Now, if you're really into Dobsonians, you'll know that a lot of things nowadays are getting faster. You know, F4, F3.5, F3.6, F3.3, F, you know... F 2.8, some of these crazy fast custom dobs are getting really, really fast. And those particular types of optics just shred apart some of the, the cheaper lenses. They, they're not designed to handle that uh, speed. So something like these 100 degree eyepieces, obviously the technology was there to give you a wider apparent field of view, which is nice, but they're actually very well corrected on the edge. So something like a modern day 82, you know, modern day eyepieces are going to have better edge correction on them. So if you are using it on like a fast refractor or a fast Dobsonian, you're going to find that while not perfect, they are going to be a lot better than something a little bit more basic uh, because they have that better edge correction in there. So kind of worth 
uh, something to take a look at if you're in that particular area of telescope. But, you know, again, that's just kind of knowing that your, your particular equipment setup. But if you are using something that's fast like that, you know, investing in some good eyepieces is probably going to be worth it. But at that point, you've got a telescope that's a couple thousand dollars. So some eyepieces to back that up is probably worth the investment of that. So, but do your research. Make sure you know what you're looking for at that point. Um, a lot of this stuff nowadays, like we were talking about earlier, like the monocentrics and the orthoscopics about pulling every ounce of performance out that still reigns true but i think you'll find that the gap has closed a lot more um nowadays because of modern technology um i know something like the the delos the teleview delos or the delights or things like that um are very good for planets especially high power stuff they do a very nice job at controlling glare but they're still going to give you that apparent field of view uh, that you're looking for I know someone said in the, the chat there that the Ethos 3.7 and 4.7, when seeing allows, and this isn't even the eyepiece's fault, it's when the seeing actually supports that type of magnification, um, which is another thing you have to pay attention to, especially when you're doing high power viewing, is those are really going to give you that capability on that, but it's all going to be dictated by how good the seeing is. I've had numerous people come in and state, my telescope's not giving me a great image. Well, it's probably because the seeing isn't supporting it, um, especially if you're pushing magnification too high. So, uh, you know, give yourself um, some time to work with, uh, work with that. And then, of course, you you definitely want to have um, that eye relief in mind. I know a lot of people wear glasses with this. Um, so something I have some friends, um, in the group that I work with, you know, I like using the ethos eyepieces, uh, 17 millimeter, my personal favorite, um, these eyepieces as well as the other hundred degree eyepieces on the market, they don't have the best eye relief to take the advantage of the full hundred degree field. So that's something you want to think about when you're looking at some of these ultra wide eyepieces like the, the ethos or the explore scientific 100s or anything of that nature. Um, if you're really in need of a long eye relief, those eyepieces probably aren't going to provide what you're looking for. Um, so you're going to ha probably have to step down to something like the 82 degrees. They might be able a little bit easier, maybe even further down to something like a 70 or a 68 um, degree, but it's something that you want to pay attention to when you're looking at these uh, ultra wide eyepieces. They're probably not going to, they, it's a compromise. You're getting a lot of that field again, but you're not getting uh, the eye relief that you want. You can't have it both ways um, and try to fit it into today's existing uh, barrels. So, again, if you're looking at ultra wide stuff like this, your eye relief will be limited on that. So if eye relief is a big deal for you, please pay attention to that. Um, cause you're going to be looking at that. So honestly, anything on the market nowadays is actually going to work, um, for nice viewing. It really comes down to when the seeing is there and when you're trying to pull everything out of there, um, that's when you really want to maximize it. So some of the pay attention to that, I want to do high power viewing of planets, the moon, um, look for eyepieces that are going to be able to support that and really give you the good contrast and transmission of light through there that you're looking for. So a lot of the modern day eyepieces are going to be good with that. Um, so it, it's very, it's a very personal, uh, choice on what you're trying to, to build there. But just make sure whatever your set's going to be is going to work for what you want to do. You're the person paying for it. You're the person using it. Make sure it's going to do what you want it to do ultimately. But do pay attention to the specs, um, especially with eye relief. Uh, if you don't need all that field of view, and especially if you're on like a tracking a telescope that's on a go-to mount or something that's tracking, maybe you don't need 
a 100 degree field of view. You could probably step down and go to something like an 82 or a 72 and get some more eye relief out of it. And that kind of viewing is going to work for you. Um, that kind of eyepiece might work better for the type of viewing that you're going to be doing. It'd be more comfortable, um, especially if you're wearing eye or glasses at that point. So uh, we are getting to the end of the webcast here. Uh, this one ended, a, we went through this a bit faster than I thought we would, but uh, we do have some time for questions really quick. Um, so let me just dig through some of these real quick. First question, is there an eyepiece that works best with eyepiece projection, especially with cell phones of planets? Um, so the best at the moment of this recording, so if you're watching this in the future, uh, the best eyepiece or the best phone adapter for a cell phone, in my opinion, is the Celestron Next YZ adapter. Uh, because of how it can adjust it's got a clamp on that that one is the best but the clamp on that can only go so wide so you're probably going to want to pay attention i don't know what the specifications on that clamp are you're gonna have to talk to celestron about that but i know if you're using something ridiculous like the holy hand grenade uh, the or something similar. I know a lot of these 30 millimeter, 82 degree eyepieces are, you know, big. I mean, this thing is almost 70 millimeters, you know, wide. Um, the clamp's not going to work on that. So you're probably going to be looking at something like a Plossel or something that's got that smaller outer housing. You know, maybe some of the 68 degree field inch and a quarter eyepieces on the market are probably the biggest that you can use, but those will work. Um, but yeah, probably a basic eyepiece. The Celestron uh, XLLX eyepieces would probably be good because they have that longer eye relief. Uh, so those would be nice as well. And they're small enough as far as the housing of the uh, eyepiece to where that clamp can actually clamp down. So you want to double check on that. As far as like actual eyepiece projection, if you're using one of those at this point, like with a camera... You're probably limited to plossels because that eyepiece projection isn't um those adapters aren't that big they're not gonna be able to mount to something like a, a modern day wide field eyepiece so something to take a look at um if you're looking for but uh let's see is there any other ones uh sorry, feather touch focus or simple eyepiece um yeah so um just to rouse them off real quick, some of the best uh, eyepiece lines out there uh, today is uh, honestly anything from Teleview and Pentax, I would probably put up at top tier. Uh, Nikon, yes, the camera company makes amazing eyepieces. So I'd probably say the top, the major top tier uh, manufacturers would be Teleview, Pentax, Nikon. Um, then we have Explore Scientific which is right up there as well. Um, Botter makes a very nice collection. They have the Hyperions, uh, which have been a very, very good set of eyepieces for a long time. Uh, if you're looking for something that's a little bit budget friendly, uh, the Botter Hyperions are excellent as long as you're using telescopes that are F6 or longer. Um, if you're using a Dobsonian or something with fast optics, I find the edges of those don't do as well. But uh, if you're using something longer focal length, the Hyperions are excellent. And they're very lightweight, so they're a great uh, balance if you're looking for that. Um, Celestron's got a lot of sets out. I don't know all of them, but my favorite that they've had out in recent years is the XLLX series. That goes from 25 millimeter to 2.3 millimeter. They're like $75, I think. Uh, that may have changed, but they're very nice eyepieces. Um, especially if you're looking for something that's more friendly to the budget, um, that would be good. If you're looking for a zoom, uh, the Botter Hyperion, whatever Mark, I think they're on Mark four right now, best eight to 24 zoom, I think is the Botter Hyperions, um, at this point, um, whatever the most recent one is. So those are just some of them on the market. Botter has another new set out. I can never remember the name of it. I think it's the Hyperions. I'm not sure. You'd have to go double check that. 
Botter has two sets out there. Um, there's the Hyperions, and I think there's a more modern set that's supposed to be very, very good, and I can't remember the name of them, but Botter makes some very nice stuff as well um, out there. Uh, there's some other questions in here. Oh, yeah, advantages of two inch to inch and a quarter. That's a very, very good uh, question. Comes up a lot. So, when you're making an eyepiece, and we now that we have all these wide apparent field of view, like, you know, 50, 60, 68 degree, so 72 degree, 82, whatever. Um, as you start designing those, you can only squeeze so much inside of a certain barrel. So for inch and a quarter eyepieces, the limitation is 68 degrees is the largest apparent field of view that you can squeeze into a barrel and the lowest power that can be done at is about 24 millimeter focal length. Um, of course, this is a 40. You can go lower on an inch and a quarter um, at that point by going to a 40 millimeter eyepiece, but it has like a 50 or 52 degree apparent field of view. So you have limitations at the inch and a quarter barrel size. So you'd have to go to something larger. So if you want to come up with something like a 30 or 31 in this case 82 degree field of view you've got to go bigger and this is actually the limit uh this guy right here is the limit of how much can be squeezed in a, in a two inch barrel you can see all that glass in there there is no more room to put that inside of an inch and a quarter barrel and that's just the limitations of each barrel size so there's no the only major advantage between inch and a quarter and two inch is the optical design that can be done in those barrels. If you're just looking for magnification, a 20 millimeter, 100 degree field eyepiece is going to give you the same magnification as a 20 millimeter plossal, whatever that is. They're going to be the same, but how much space you have around is going to be different. So, a 20 millimeter plossal can be done in an inch and a quarter barrel. There's no need to make a two inch version of it because you're just kind of wasting materials. Um, or if you want to have that wider apparent field of view, you got to step up to a two inch. So it really just comes out to the design of the eyepiece optically that's going to dictate what barrel size it is. A two inch is just going to give you more room to work with as an eyepiece designer. But from a user perspective, the only major difference that we get is how much space do you want to have around it? So that's kind of the difference between uh, that. Um, best zoom eyepiece. I said that earlier. Botter Hyperions, I think, are the best ones on the market. Uh, Pentax makes a zoom as well, but I think the best one for astronomy purposes across the board. A lot of people would agree that Botter Hyperions are very, very nice. Uh, let's see. Are very wide field EPs needed for bino viewer or binoculars? Well, most bino viewers on the market are inch and a quarter, uh, only have inch and a quarter. There's one bino viewer that I know that is two inch. And I've used that one, but you are limited uh, still by the barrel size um, of the outer housing. I think the my buddy uses two 22 Teleview Nagler type fours in that um, you couldn't put two 31 Naglers next to each other because your eye, it overlaps. You couldn't get your eyes close enough for the most part, unless you've your eyes are far apart. Um, but a lot of times, most bino viewers are going to be uh, inch and a quarter format. So you're going to be limited to whatever that's going to be like low power, probably looking at like 32 plossels or maybe like a 24, 68 degree eyepiece at like a Teleview Panoptic 24 or um, Explore Scientific makes a 24, 68. That's really nice. Those would work in a bino viewer. Um, you don't have to have the wide eyepieces. It's kind of just personal taste at that point. But a lot of the stuff on the market nowadays is that wider uh, field of view. But if you're doing something like the sun, a pair of like 32 or 25 plossels would be perfectly fine for the sun. You wouldn't need any of the, you know, exotic stuff to make that happen. 
Uh, let's see. Is there any other stuff floating out there? I think that's it. Well, that puts us right about 1050. So, uh, if you guys have any other questions, now's the time to throw them into the mix. Um, other than that, that's pretty much it for this week's episode. Let me pop back over here so we can see what's going on. Uh, like I said earlier, if you like what you see here on the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Uh, leave a like on a video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or maybe you want us to do a particular topic for a video, go ahead and email that to info at skywatcherusa.com. Uh, we do plan these out usually by quarter. So if you have an idea, just because we haven't done it like the next week or two doesn't mean we're not going to get around to it. But we try to plan and schedule these out by quarter um, of the year. So, you know, if you if you give us an idea now, you'll probably end up seeing it sometime next year. Just an FYI, I know some people have asked uh, when they've emailed in. Um, on that so but if you like what you see here go ahead and subscribe we really appreciate it leave a like on a video that keeps it going for us next week we're going to be talking about building a backyard observatory which i think many of us have dreamed about doing and i think it comes up a lot because there are some things to consider i might have to bring in a friend of mine who's done it um, a little bit more than i have so uh, maybe we'll have a unexpected guest here uh, next week on what to consider um, when doing something like that. But that is something that people need to think about if you're looking at doing it. There's some advantages between the designs out there. So we're going to do that next week um, right here at the What's Up webcast. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. But other than that, that is eyepieces and when to use them. Hopefully it was fun and educational for everybody. Um, and yeah, thanks for spending your Friday morning with us. Or if you're watching this later, thanks for spending the time with us. So have a great weekend. Please be safe. Go out and observe the moon. The planets are up this weekend. And uh, we will see you guys next Friday for another episode of the What's Up webcast. Uh, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye.